Dude, we're gonna we're just gonna go through the first two verses and see how it goes. I had a little bit more time to study and get into the nitty gritty, I guess, about everything. I just want to see how it goes because there are a couple of different sort of vantage points to look at the verses from, and I just figured it might be worth a try to instead of just like go over the and the generally understood and just to pick out like yep this is what it means and then we move on to kind of examine it a little bit more if that makes sense but anyway so yeah we'll, we'll, we'll probably get through this slower than what we have been going through with the other books but that's okay because it's short anyway jude a bond servant of jesus christ and brother of james to those who are called sanctified by god the father and preserved in jesus christ Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. A brief prayer, as Alistair Begg would say. <laughs> Lord, use this time of study and reveal yourself to us. Teach us through this time. Bless it now, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, yeah, very deep theological um, exposition here. So much to get into. It's Jude, who is a bondservant of Christ and the brother of James. And he's writing to the called, who are sanctified by the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ for mercy, peace, and love. There is, uh, like I said, there are, especially in the second section, about called, sanctified, preserved. There's a couple of different, not interpretations per se, but um, to sort of superimpose meaning behind it or purpose behind why he said it the way that he said it. And one of them is kind of the general uh, consensus between the commentaries. And the other one is kind of me, I guess. So whether it is useful or not, I guess, is between you and the Lord. Because either way, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily detract from what is being said. But I feel like there if you look at it the way that I, when I was studying and kind of going through the words and everything, and then it gives more, um, not necessarily validity, but it gives more context for the rest of the things that he's going to be talking about. Namely, those who are in the church, who are deceiving, who are um, encouraging people away from what is undefiled religion per se. And it, he's delineating between who are the real believers who actually pursue righteousness and the broken and contrite spirit in light of our sin and towards repentance in contrast to those who live this life, as it were, of uh, an appearance of godliness for the sake of personal gain or uh, just to stir up trouble in a way. And he, from... From verse 3, that's kind of what he, he talks about, his reason for writing. He wanted to just talk to them about some common salvatory principle. He doesn't specify what it is. But then he says, I found it necessary to write, to exhort, to contend for the faith. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, ungodly, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> that being said... Hence my sort of, uh, again, not interpretation. It's not like this is a way to use his words and turn it to look like this certain thing. Both ways that the commentaries were sort of describing it and the way that I was sort of looking like, hey, that kind of, that there's a bit of a parallel here. They're both consistent with the character of Christ and whatever. So, again, this is a bit of an experiment for me because I, I don't usually differ from what is already expressed in the old dead guys or the old alive guys. But because of my extra time studying, I just felt like it would be worth, worth just looking at the implications of the words. Anyway, long introduction. Who is writing Jude? Who is Jude? He is a bondservant of Christ and the brother of James. So 
as everybody always points out, this is not Jude, as in Judas Iscariot, but this guy's name was Judas, or Judah variation, which is probably a namesake from the son of Joseph, I mean, uh, the son of Jacob, Judah, and then this guy altered it to be Jude, or shortened it to be Jude, likely to distinguish from Iscariot, because uh, not someone you want to be um, associated with in this culture, especially names are very prominent and very uh, meaningful, and your relations are also very meaningful, and who you are associated with, your accolades in a way. And one of the interesting things about him calling himself Jude, a bondservant in Christ and brother of James, is that in Mark 6, 3, he's the, the Pharisees speaking about Jesus. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters with us? So they were offended at him. So James was the half-brother of Jesus, half-brother in the sense that Jesus was not Joseph's biological son because he was uh, conceived supernaturally through the Spirit, hence virgin birth, all that. But Mary and Joseph did have kids between themselves who are apparently James, Joseph's Judas and Simon. And we know that that is, that is James the apostle, like the author and one of the disciples. And his brother is Judas. And this guy says his name is, is Jude, Judas, who is the brother of James the apostle. So this Jude, this Judas, is the half-brother of Jesus, Christ. But instead of saying Jude, the brother of Jesus Christ and the apostle James, he says Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Why on earth would you do that? You might think, hey, that's, uh, that would be kind of useful. Credentials, you know, I'm the brother of the Messiah, you know, no big deal. But <laughs> and, and also, you know, the brother of one of the great disciples of Christ, um, I'm in that circle, you know, um, writing to you believers, so pay attention. You can see how a lot of people would do that, but in a way, the way that he writes this is both humble in, in his, in his uh, association, what he prefers to be understood as, and also more meaningful and um, gives more weight to the relation. I'll talk about that in a second, but so him not referring to himself as the brother of Jesus is, is a, a display of humility. He's not dropping names, not dropping uh, association. Uh, he's not making himself out to be this great guy just because he's my brother. Though, in a way, James also has some uh, credibility in the church populace, and so he associates him with, as the brother of James, but you could in, impose that that was just another way to distinguish himself from Judas Iscariot, because Judas Iscariot was not the brother of James. But also, uh, it could be worth mentioning that it is worth the honor um, to James to give him that sort of uh, status, that kindredness to him. Like, yeah, that's my brother, James. That's my, that's my guy. But now back to the relation to Jesus, which is more meaningful and which is more beneficial to be the quote-unquote biological brother of Jesus Christ or to be the servant of the Messiah, the, the, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Because to be the, the earthly, the mundane brother of Jesus and to glorify that, instead of to glorify the per se divine relation within the spirit, 
this relationship that he has through the Spirit to Jesus Christ as Messiah, as Lord, is another uh, a variation on the quote that my my father often says, where people always say, blood is thicker than water. Family is thicker than people who aren't. Your, the, the relation, the kindred spirit there is more meaningful than people who are not your family. But the addition is the spirit is thicker than blood. Your church family, the body of Christ, is a greater relationship and a more honorable pursuit, if you want to put it like that, than just earthly uh, brotherhood. And that being said, it is actually probably better, not just for the sake of humility, but for the sake of illustrating what is, what is ne a necessary mindset for us, that Judas doesn't associate his relationship with Christ in a physical uh, aspect as much as he does the spiritual. In God, in the Spirit, I am a servant, and rightly so, because Jesus is God. And James, Jude is just a man. So uh, something for us to key into, that our relationship with Christ is through the Spirit. And in that, that we are a part of the body of Christ, where I am a bondservant, he also equates himself with the other believers we're all servants of Christ. We're all equal in Christ and we're all under Christ. So it has a, a multifaceted um, practicality, I guess. So yeah, a, a good thing. A, a good uh, introduction for him of who he is. This is who I am. And he is writing to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. The commentary explanation for all this looks into the the fact that in the original text it was actually written as to those who are sanctified by the father and preserved in christ who are called and the the linking of the verbiage and everything is it's to the called it's separate from the sanctification and the preservation so it is to the called who are sanctified and preserved, or those that are sanctified and preserved, which are the called. <clears throat> Just kind of similar to the idea that he said, I am Jude, who is a bondservant and a brother of James, or I am the servant of Christ and the brother of James, namely Jude, which is cool. But so who are the called? The, the word is the same word that we we understand as the, the 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 principle of like to walk worthy of the call to which we've been called we were called by god we we love him because he first loved us we follow him because he first called us kind of a thing a past and present and future encouragement you have been called previously and you are presently loved there there was that love of god in the past you know when we were saved and it continues in the, the perfect present tense he continues to love us and we're his children since we've been called and that we are preserved or as the niv would say kept in jesus christ uh, for a future hope right and then that's sort of all of the uh, the, the gravity that the writers put on this which is a, which is awesome but as i was saying earlier and as i was reading through it it's like why would jude not just say to the believers or to the church i'm a bond servant of christ and brother of james and i'm writing to the saints and i want you guys to have mercy peace and love multiplied to you if we examine the words to those who are called matthew 22 1 to 4 
Jesus is speaking a parable to the people, and he says, and it's a bit of a lengthy passage, but worth going through, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And this word called in Jude, in other um, translations will say, in other manuscripts will say, invited. So they invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted calf are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed the murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. We'll stop there. Later on, at the end of this, he says, Many are called, but few are chosen. And we understand that it is the will of God that none should perish, that but all should come to repentance, that Christ died for the sins of the world, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So, we've been called, yes, but there are those who have been called who have not been sanctified and preserved. There are those who were called, who have been invited to the family of God, who have not become beloved of God as adopted children. And, he, and so he continues in the parable, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And the interpretation of that is the wedding garment is, of course, like being sealed by the Spirit, to, to be clothed to be made a new creature to be taken out of the world and into the family into the uh, the party if the first word in this trio is to be called to be invited and then to be <coughs> sanctified by the father the word can also be translated treated as holy dedicated or purified and then other trend, other uh, versions will say beloved, agapetos, or loved in the NIV, agapeo. You have been called to God, and then you have been established by the Father in the love of God. So these are the people who have dedicated themselves to the Lord, who have been washed like they say, Christianity is God reaching out to man. But there are those who do not take his hand, who do not surrender, who do not acknowledge the reality and, and the invitation, the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. And those are not chosen. Those are not sanctified. Those are not renewed. And also, given the fact that to be sanctified is to be loved by God, in John 17, Jesus is praying for the believers. And he says, I do not pray for these alone, which is talking about the disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am that they may be behold my glory which you have given me, 
for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Preserved in the Son, or as the NIV would put it, for the Son, by the Son. So they have been called, and then they have been adopted, and now they are made, preserved, continue to be molded in Christ, to be uh, that, that, that the love that they've been given by God is now something that is produced in them and unifies them through Christ, through the word of God. And if Jude is writing, which, which we established earlier, is writing to distinguish, to delineate the true believers from those who are, quote, in the church, who are Christians, who are teachers, but not children of God, where the fruit of the Spirit, love, is not in them, or they're not abiding in in Christ and kept in Christ and sanctified to the Father, though they're still called, would it not make sense that that is his greeting also? Like, well, he could have just said to the believers, to the church, and that would also have the same implications because the real believers, the real church, are those who fit this description. And so it wouldn't be those wolves in sheep's clothing. But he said it this way, by the Holy Spirit. And then writes the same sort of description out, with, and consequences and, and things like that, for them to understand who is who and what is what. Alternatively, like the commentaries say, he could have just been writing this as an encouragement to them to just sort of um, affirm them in, in their um, calling and in their Christ-likeness as they are sanctified to God. He may have, you know, written the whole letter and then realized just how short it was and kind of went back and rewrote the greeting and extended it a little just by the Spirit to elongate the letter. Or he could have done it with the intention of, of making it clear that those who are of God, who are in Christ, those who are sanctified by the Father and are preserved in Christ, these are the, these are the qualifiers apart from those who are called, yet are still in the world yet are still of their father, the devil, and who are kept for this condemnation in verse 4, which is proper, which is the actual intention, the, the, the usage by the Spirit's uh, inspiration. You can decide for yourself. Again, it doesn't really change much per se, but to me, I think it, it makes the, the gravity of the phrasing and, and the terms greater. Not that the commentaries are wrong, because I could be just putting this, you know, throwing this in there, and it's not like, not, you know, just trying to pick out the pieces um, a, little, a little too hypercritical of what's going on here. But like I said, I had, I decided to take extra time to study the this little section here instead of just going through the, you know, maybe the first five verses instead. Um, but <laughs> as you can probably tell, we're only going to touch on the idea of mercy, peace, and love. Cause I, I think, I think that is just a general apostolic prayer and it fits in like how Paul often 
um, prays for them grace, peace, and love. And as they would say, you cannot know the peace of God without the grace or the mercy of God. So he prays that they would continue in the mercy of God, that they would experience it and it would um, nurture in them peace and a quality of walk that allows them to express love to one another and for God. Um, and that the love of God would just continue to marinate within them, that it would be multiplied to them but to those who are the called and sanctified and preserved, the called and beloved and adopted and, and purified and preserved and kept and, and set apart in Christ, by Christ, for Christ. And that is something that is missing from the church, the church the believers again not that we are saved by works but the works prove the faith our lives our sanctification our being set apart our producing the character of love that we are abiding in Christ and in his love and he is in us that we have the garments of holiness not just the appearance of it of godliness is 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 something to to be wary of because not all who say lord lord will enter the kingdom did we not do miracles in your name did we not serve in the church in the body those who will just simply claim it but who really were just you know spies infiltrators crept in unnoticed marked out for condemnation because of X, Y, Z, which we'll get into later. But yeah, again, a short passage, but there, there's a lot to understand there about who we really are and, and our relationship to Christ and to other believers and what that should um, encourage us to, to do, how it should encourage us to live. And that being said, I will stop <laughs> I've gone on I think I've gone on long enough, but we'll move on to the to the the more meat of the letter later. But I think there's some meat in there too. Um, it's important and therefore it is worth saying. It's the word of God, so it's worth looking into, worth applying to our lives. So grace and mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. See you guys next time.